All right. So now with that, we start off on the first session of the day. So as we would say, let's sell sail, uh, sail today. And this is going to be a conversation between two industry leaders, one from a heritage conglomerate and another from the startup world. We are delighted to invite Mr. Shivadeep Banerjee, Chief Digital Marketing Officer at ITC Limited. At ITC, Shivadeep successfully started the function of data and analytics, online reputation management, and evangelized digital media within the organization. He's also been instrumental in creating new practices like marketing command center, customer data hub, and e-commerce. Also inviting which, with Shivadeep is Vinay Singh to the conversation. Vinay Singh is the co-founder and partner at Fireside Ventures, he comes with over 15 years of experience in FMCG, consumer brands, and technology industries, and has built deep expertise in the areas of marketing, brand management, sales, technology, and digital commerce. He's on the board of seven companies and has played a key role in mentoring uh, multiple uh, new age brands like Mama Earth, Boat, amongst the others. Uh, he's also worked in leadership roles at UL and McKinsey prior to starting Fireside. Welcome, Shivadeep and Vinay, and over to you. Morning, everyone. Uh... A big thank you to MRSI for organizing these uh, two days of uh, wonderfully organized uh, market research seminar. Um, I really missed yesterday. Uh, I heard I really, really uh, was supposed to be part of some of these sessions, which I hope I'll get some recordings of. Um, welcome to day two. And uh, I think day two starts with a cracker of a session. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome Vinay Singh. Um, he is the co-founder and partner of Fireside Ventures and literally has been instrumental in firing up uh, the startup universe in this country. Thanks, Vinay, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I feel I'm in a room of a lot of intelligence and <laughs> a little intimidated. <laughs> Thanks for that start, Vinay. Um, we heard um, Vinay has been a really a champion in the D2C world. Um, he has mentored some of the very, very big names, Kapiva, Mama Earth, Boat, Slurp Farm, and so on. Vinay is also in the board of uh, seven companies, Vinay. Um, some, of the, some of them are really, really interesting. Uh, I think 91 Cycles, um, all those who are in this room uh, and are cyclists should really visit that site. Gyanoveda, again, a great platform for women health. Um, my favorite, Samosa Singh. Uh, I, I love it. It's in Bangalore too. And uh, if you guys have not tasted the samosas there, you should really pick them up. With them, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome Vinay Singh. Thank you. Pleasure being here. Vinay, uh, we heard all those names, right? Kapiva, Mama Earth, 91 Cycles and so on. Um, great successes. But sometimes there is this little crib that we all have saying that, you know, um, media and the world really blow out of proportion the success of uh, startups. Um, but there's a lot to learn from the failures that they have gone through. You would have witnessed a lot. Uh, why don't you share, starting in the session, your learnings from the failures? Yeah, I mean, uh, at Fireside, we've been uh, around for about six years now and... Uh, our, uh, if I look at our portfolio, we've got about 44 companies uh, that we have had the opportunity to partner with. Um, any In any forum, our calling card is always, you know, you know, we were investors in Mama Earth and Boat. And if you were to do an L2 dig in on a double click, then we'll have names like Kapiva, Gainoveda, Yoga Bar, etc. They'll come up. But there are 44 other companies, right? And um, not all... Uh, go on to become world-beating companies. Many of them find their home as an M&A into other companies like Big Basket, CureFit, um, Nika, Baiju's, etc. And we don't really get to talk about it as often as uh, we talk about the others. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, big, the big learnings there are really, uh, I think, for most founders, um, for them to be able to a have a deep enough insight and not sell a product but sell a purpose i think is super important and in many cases when uh, when when entrepreneurs have started with a product and not been able to elevate the conversation with their consumers i think uh, they have faced some kind of a wall uh, some kind of a ceiling to where uh, they could take uh, their brands 
uh, and super important for founders to very early think about why is it they're doing what they're doing and why is it that this brand needs to exist among so many other stories out there. Um, I think the other um, big learning is this whole uh, drug of performance marketing, right? I mean, it gets you started for sure. Uh, but um, it's like uh, your classic Freakonomics the cocaine dealer, right? Like you get the first few samples for free at a party and then you got to play with your life with it. And that's pretty much what performance marketing does. The first few thousand customers you feel very happy about and then suddenly the CAC LTV equations don't make sense anymore. And if, if uh, entrepreneurs have not thought about, okay, how do we, uh, uh, you know, start looking at creating genuine pull, genuine mind measure movements in the consumer's life. In fact, one of the big, uh, and this will be music to everyone's ear, uh, ears out here would be, one of the big cribs that we on the boards of all these companies have is, why don't we have brand tracks in our <laughs> process early enough? Um, and founders are like, sales hora hai, to the brand track kar ke kya karenge? But the point is that by the time they realize that they started hitting a ceiling, uh, then you know putting all the machinery into not only tracking but also creating uh, you know proposition, functional differentiation, etc., uh, could be a bridge too late because um, in the startup world you always have a runway and that's a ticking time bomb. You don't have um, unlimited amount of capital uh, and unlimited amount of time to achieve a lot of tick boxes in your you know little toolkit. Yeah, you, you touched upon two very very important points. I think yesterday we heard a lot around purpose from Subbu um, and um, many of these when uh, many of the brands that are operating today uh, are trying to define that purpose um, need not necessarily and, and, and you might want to touch upon need not necessarily be a planet saving one always do you, do you, do you think that all purposes needs to be a planet saving um, option not at all I think uh, that that sounds very nice in boardrooms but um, if, if your brand uh, naturally lends itself to it then fair enough uh, but most importantly, uh, your consumer has to resonate with it. Uh, so Gynoveda, the one that you picked up uh, out of the uh, boards that I serve on, uh, their purpose is actually to give access to uh, sexual and reproductive health to all women. That's the purpose. It's as simple as that. And in a, in a country like India with all its cultural nuances, social issues, talking about uh, uh, you know, the, the, the topic of uh, menstruation is such a taboo even today. They're trying to break that ceiling and open that conversation and uh, want to empower women to have that conversation across social strata. That's their purpose. They're saying, let people start talking about it. And eventually, that lends itself very well to the business of the brand because the more people talk about it, the more they will seek help, the more people will end up um, at the counter of the brand, but more importantly, it resonates very well with the consumer. Uh, because uh, today's younger consumer, the Gen Z, even the Gen Alpha, which are teenagers today in schools, um, are not okay with, uh, you know, brushing these topics under the carpet. They want to talk about it. So, yeah, I mean, as long as the consumer resonates with it, um, for example, Alpha Vector 91 Cycles, the one you talked about, their purpose is to ensure that every child has access to physical education. Cycles is one part of it. That's the business they're in. The purpose of the brand is to make sure that kids move because in today's increasingly connected world, actually kids are very disconnected. I mean, we used to have, you know, growing up gangs of kids running around the streets, uh, you know, creating havoc every evening. Uh, but we don't see that anymore as often and, and that's what uh, 91 is trying to change. So it, nothing to do with the planet. By the way, the, the brand lends itself very well to the planet because every time you cycle, you actually eschew riding a motorcycle or a car, so it's great for the planet. But that's something that the consumer did not uh, resonate with. So I think it's important for brands to recognize uh, who you're selling to. And the biggest pain point for parents who are considering buying bicycles for their kids was, listen, my kid doesn't move. He leads a sedentary lifestyle. He prefers his iPad over anything else. So how do I get out of that? Excellent point. In fact, uh, the second point that uh, you, what 
I hear you say is that the fundamental fundamentals of marketing. When when the startup world happened and the explosion happened, uh, we all felt that this is a very different world altogether. They don't believe in insights. They don't believe in market research. And here's their entire fraternity sitting here. And um, they only believe in launch and learn. Uh, and here you're talking about uh, brand track. It's music to the ears. Um, thank you for that. Um, Vinay, we also currently see that when we look at the startup world, um, and I'm talking from a food and beverage lens also, saying that natural, authenticity, traceability, planet worthy, um, and stuff like that all around you. Is there an idea drought somewhere happening? And are we all trying to jump into the bandwagon of technology first rather than idea first? Do you see that happening in your startup world? Um, and that's leading to some kind of, I mean, that's not the causality behind some kind of so-called slowdown in the, in the startup uh, universe. But do you see this idea drought stuff happening all around you? Yeah, I think, uh, and by the way, I had the um, uh, good fortune of spending the evening with a lot of food entrepreneurs yesterday. So we had uh, Neeraj from Paperboat and PC Mustafa from ID Fresh and the Samosa Singh folks, the uh, Meghna from Slurp Farm, Rahul from Fruborn. And uh, we're just jamming and um, we, we picked up this topic. Uh, somebody asked this question saying, yeah, health, wellness, uh, and everybody, all the entrepreneurs unanimously, so they're, they're investors and they're entrepreneurs. I think investors have an idea drought for sure, because all of us said, yes, yes, health, wellness, that, that's the new thing, etc. Because, you know, we just li like to look west and see what's happening then try to ape it. But the entrepreneurs actually have their ear to the ground and they said, listen, what you're talking about works for India Alpha, that's about 25 million households in India. And your idea is not going to extend beyond that. You want to build a nifty 200, 300 crore business with 25 million households with deep uh, retention. Great, go for it. Then then, then do uh, those um, healthy snacks or wellness products, etc. But if you want to appeal to real India 1 and India 2, uh, then you cannot eschew taste. Now, we, 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 we kind of played back saying, listen, but the whole world, there's a trend towards healthier, there's a trend towards this thing. The, the biggest insight for me was, where is the consumer coming from? So for example, Neeraj launched, uh, he's a founder of Paperboat. He launched a pomegranate juice at 20 rupees. This is the only juice in the country, pomegranate flavor available at 20. 150,000 households this summer tried pomegranate juice packaged for the first time. They've never tried pomegranate juice before packaged. Their source of growth was from the roadside juice wala, an upgradation from there without any contamination, without any dirty ice going in there, without any uh, questionable water going in there, having a healthy pomegranate juice. That is how the consumer played it back to Neeraj, saying this is healthy. For them, that is the definition of health because that's where the source of growth is from. So therefore, the definition of better for you, healthier for you, I think will change as you figure out which is your consumer segment that you're going after. The trend might still be there, but the manifestation of the trend might be quite different. Um, uh, so I think there is no idea drought, uh, so as to speak. I think entering certain sub segments in food given the price points at which they are, require you to have a certain scale because you need the distribution to make it available. Online platforms don't allow you to sell a 20 rupee, 30 rupee price point. And that's why food is much more challenging to innovate than let's say beauty and personal care. Uh, and and uh, therefore I think um, whenever we uh, interface with entrepreneurs, uh, our, our bias is always to win in one geography, you know, prove the entire mix is working, spend ahead of time to build distribution in one geography, build your mind measures there, see if the whole mix is working and then take it forward. Very similar to what a new launch in a large company would be looking like, but I hope at much lesser cost, I don't know. Um, we were, uh, I mean, and you must have heard this enough number of times that we were all chatting up on uh, metaverse, 
uh, many of us actually felt that it's not, not going to really take off. And I'm talking from a technology standpoint now. Um, it did not. Now we are on Gen AI, and we think this is a pivotal moment uh, for us to co uh, create content quicker, sharper, at scale, and so on and so forth. And uh, blockchain, blockchain also happened, and it also is playing a subtle role in certain pockets. Um, do you think we, whether it's the, and, and Aman introduced us, introduced me saying heritage, legacy, and all those words you added. Do you think that organizations like ours or startups are actually considering technology first? Um, is that our way of thinking that, okay, uh, uh, we need to think about Gen AI and then we think about a brand idea. Do you see that thing happening from entrepreneurs or it's not that way? Uh, I mean, see, entrepreneurs, um, the way they look at the market is like a battlefield where... Uh, they are facing the mighty cannons of the big, uh, the big uh, legacy companies, right? The, the large uh, brands that have already been established over years. They have built multiple moats in their business, whether it's price points, whether it's distribution, consumer insights, brand equity, and, and they got to fight all of that. So uh, think of them as, uh, you know, guerrillas with their little slings and trying to see if they can maybe break a wheel of some of the, one of these <laughs> cannons somewhere. So they will, they will actually experiment. Um, I don't think they will leave any stone unturned to see, can I get an advantage for three months, for six months, for nine months? Eventually people will catch up. But can I get that little bit of an advantage that helps me scale in a frictionless manner or a noiseless manner? And I think that's the reason why we see more, a lot of entrepreneurs being very open and possibly as you as you mentioned jumping onto every new tech bandwagon because they're looking for that can i yeah can i can i replace this slingshot with a catapult or look at some uh, arsenal um, or some weaponry in their arsenal that uh, that can help give them a fighting chance in this battlefield let's stuff out there um, and therefore uh, for example gen ai now we know it's very new but uh, under the hood, a lot of the portfolio that we work with is already experimenting with it, saying, hey, um, can I automate my uh, ad copy um, based on micro segments using Gen AI? Can I, uh, for example, use Gen AI to have post-sales conversations with my consumers? And can that help me bump up retention? Uh, uh, for example, and the other one we didn't talk about is ONDC, which is the hot topic right now, right? So they don't know what's going to happen with ONDC, right? But let's get listed on ONDC. Let's be there. And as the discovery platforms and the demand side for ONDC opens up, we'll figure out what to do with it. But at least we are there. Uh, we don't want to be in a catch-up game later on. So I think that's the usual attitude that um, most entrepreneurs would have. Because, see, they don't have a distribution in many cases. Even if they do, it's a very small distribution, easy to manage. It's not as complex as uh, it is for very large companies. So it doesn't take up a lot of their time. So they have a lot of free time. Uh, unless, of course, the investor comes and kind of tries to question them about useless things. Uh, apart from that, they have a lot of time to experiment with multiple things. Vineb, uh, that uh, takes us into a nice segue into the point that... Um on uh, these startups uh, have the appetite for taking these risks, uh, have some great bright ideas uh, which they want to execute. They take it small, they learn, they, they pivot, they, they change, and then they try to figure out how to create that edge that you were talking about. Parallelly now, I think large brands, large organizations have also figured out ways and means to fight this battle and... Um, see how they can hold on to their market shares or grow them despite, and even in those pockets, and I'm talking India Alpha or even Gen Alpha, Gen, Gen Z audience, etc., cetera, where um, it, is imp it was imperative for the large brands to figure out ways to fight these battles. How do the, and, and, and these small companies and these startups, today or tomorrow, you started with a conversation on CAC, 
uh, today or tomorrow finds that the unit economics is not holding because there's a lot of investments that needs to be done. Performance marketing was a way to start, but not necessarily the only way out because the fundamentals of marketing remains. How do you see this battle of uh, startup versus the large brands, large legacy organizations? How do you see this panning out going forward and today? Yeah, I mean, uh, going forward, uh, Shubhadeep, I'm, I'm not, I'm, let, let, let's try and co-build it together. I don't know. But uh, let's talk about a little bit of history, right? So uh, 2016, when we started conceptualizing Fireside and we started meeting the first wave of D2C entrepreneurs, I think uh, their eyes were like very lit up. They said, listen, it's an open field. Um, the e-commerce teams in large organizations is sitting in the modern trade team. We know what kind of focus they're going to get. So nobody's focusing. There's, a, there's so much of commerce happening on, on Amazon, on Flipkart, on Big Basket, on, on, on Nika. But the big brands which have the right to win there are not merchandising it well. And therefore, there's a land grab opportunity. At the same time, uh, digital media beyond YouTube was not really being understood very well. And they said, listen, there's a land grab opportunity on audiences on Facebook, on Instagram, Snapchat, etc. So uh, I think that was the wave one of D2C startups. Um, and and they what they did really well was understood how to play these channels well. And then the pandemic came and then suddenly offline got shut. And um, I think the pendulum swung the other way, where suddenly everybody over-optimized on, 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 on online channels, on online discovery platforms, media houses, etc. And that's when entrepreneurs had nowhere to hide then, because suddenly, as you said, the unit economics stopped working. And then they said, hey, we need a change in thinking, we need a change in business model. And suddenly they're like, listen, we're going to stop consumer acquisition because we can't survive anymore. But they still need to grow. So the only way to grow is through retention. So they started focusing on retention, saying, hey, we want to build a $100 million, an 800 crore business. In our lifetime, we don't want to acquire more than 2 million consumers. But we'll sell something to them five times in a year at $10 a pop. And we'll build an 800 crore business. And 2 million into whatever, 300, 400 rupees CAC, this is the, all the capital we ever want to raise in our life. And this, then they started putting a lot, of, lot more emphasis on CDPs, on on uh, you know, buyer profiles, marketing automation, chat, <coughs> call centers, etc., to make sure that the retention numbers start coming through. So the money that they're going to give to Mark Zuckerberg or Sundar Pichai, they started giving to call centers. So that that's a new business model that emerged. I think today we are seeing the new set of entrepreneurs who are actually being more bold with their choices and saying, "Listen, uh, we are going to play all channels." Uh, depending on uh, the merit of the channel. So uh, we will use our D2C website as an online lab. So like you said earlier in the conversation, they will launch things, figure out what is working, what has retention, what has good reviews, ratings, etc. And then kind of scale that up. What doesn't they kill very fast or kind of reformulate, etc. But that's the role of the D2C channel. They're not looking at D2C channel for massive sales. The next sale, leg of growth goes into growing online channels uh, like an Amazon, a Flipkart, etc. But they only want about 5 to 8% of non-brand category search uh, keyword. They're saying, listen, we don't want to bid beyond that because the reos doesn't make sense. Which basically means that they need to go offline much sooner if they need scale. And they're saying, listen, we need to build skill sets of offline even faster. And that has seen a whole new set of entrepreneurs coming up to create distribution platforms. So everything becomes an API that plugs into each other and people can collaborate and grow together rather than individually each guy trying to act it out on his own. So I think that, to my, so, so my mind, uh, the future will be that I think this, um, uh, the marketplace will see more innovation. I think wherever entrepreneurs see consumers being underserved, they will go out and try to serve them. Uh, they'll try to serve them through business models and channel models that make more economic sense because I think the world of 0% money printing is over. <laughs> so <laughs> we will also be careful with how we deploy capital. 
but um, i still think that uh, uh, very large uh, brands are yet to be unearthed and built in india and i think uh, going forward we we've started seeing collaboration already like for example uh, what we did with uh, with you guys and yoga bar and uh, marico has done a bunch of acquisitions unilever has done a bunch of acquisitions i think between investment acquisition etc i think we'll see a lot more collaboration uh, i think any mature ecosystem if i look at let's say the us tech ecosystem it works that way i think it's a matter of time before it comes into our industry cognizant of the time i think uh, we are some 60 seconds away but i can't help but not ask this question to you um this entire room is uh, filled with people who are always on the lookout for trends right and we receive lots of signals today uh how do you decide which signals you want to bet on that's one part of the question the second part of the question is we as researchers are evolving and we need to evolve further from where we are today uh so what would be your advice to this entire fraternity here in terms of how should we change our outlook towards inciting and our outlook towards the lingo that we are using today in the way we uh speak suggest support uh, all the businesses that we are supporting today i think um, entrepreneurs uh, uh, place uh, it, it, and i can answer it's only for the startup world right yeah yeah um, uh, i think entrepreneurs place a lot of uh, premium on time and anything that is more self serve anything that is a faster turnaround um uh, even if it is not a 100% accurate or statistically not doesn't have a confidence interval of 98% that's fine even if it's 80% but comes to me 3 days or 5 days earlier i will run with it add my gut instinct on top of what i saw from the data and create my business decision that i need to take um anything that and especially in this data rich world um, most uh, founders have access to multiple sources of data whether it is first party or third party uh, so having larger sample sets which are much more representative at real time i think that's what entrepreneurs really kind of value rather than only sampling based data they'll supplement it but they will not rely solely on it i think those would be two ways in which i see entrepreneurs being very different from traditional brand managers uh, they're also changing by the way we are also not looking for 98% confidence intervals great it's a convergence then <laughs> yeah so thank you very much uh, i i think um, we had this opportunity to um, see what is behind the scenes um, going behind um, in, in in the in the green room as far as startups are concerned and uh, thanks a lot for sharing your pearls of wisdom um we have learned a lot i have personally learned a lot from from whatever you shared today and would pick up those threads from there uh, going forward thank you very much vinay thank you so much for having me questions yeah uh the first one being being an entrepreneur how can one balance between having a focused portfolio being an entrepreneur how can one balance between having a focused portfolio that they have already built and uh, uh, built and from there how to move on to greener fields in a safe and profitable manner well, i think uh, innovation doesn't stop um, in most of our companies the shape of business the way it will look is there will be you know maybe 100 to 200 skews that would be present on their d2c website 30 40 of which would churn out every quarter 30 40 new would get added out of those 100 to 200 hardly about 40 to 50 would be available on most marketplaces because those are the ones which have validated some kind of a kind of like a post launch evaluation metric and scorecard they would have um, been above the median on reviews on ratings on retention consumer love and maybe only four or five of them the entrepreneur actually take offline which are his real hero sku so i think it's a it's a process that uh, one needs to keep investing in obviously uh, you got to find your 5 to 10 hero skews which you can really bet big bucks on and and drive penetration off of uh, but um, i think unlike 
brands 1.0 where you had one SKU which you took all over the country, did you know mass carpet bombing and drove penetration. In today's world, you need to do both together where you drive penetration through your hero's SKUs, but also keep driving more consumption in the households that have bought you in the past or have a positive predisposition towards you. Thank you so much.